So my name is Ahmed. I'm Arab. I'm American. And I produce, produce and co-host a show on Al Jazeera called The Stream. Now, it's important that I start there because in the past 10 years since 9-11, my name, my heritage, and even my employer was known to be a subject of discrimination, controversy, and fear. Now, on YouTube, if you type Ahmed in the search results, the first video that comes up with almost 7 million views and one of the most watched is called Ahmed the Terrorist. Now, it's an act where a ventriloquist has a puppet called, oh, forgive me, got to go back there. Okay, a ventriloquist has a puppet um, called Ahmed, and he claims to be a terrifying terrorist. Now, there's a lot of times in my life, especially on my show, where I feel like a puppet, but I've certainly never felt like a terrorist. But it's true, in the past 10 years, I've had to endure countless terrorist jokes, racial slurs at weddings, at schools, um, you know, anywhere you can imagine, and even had a police officer in Boston once yell to me, and this is the PG virgin, version, mind you, um, shut up, you bleep, 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 Arab towel head, as he arrested me and put me in the back of his cop car, only to have the charges dropped later. Now, I'm not going to go into that story, but you can talk to me afterwards about it. I've also met many Arabs who've changed their name from Muhammad to Tony, or from uh, Yusuf to Joe. There are many stories similar to that story, which have been perpetuated in part by the media. But I am fortunately not here to tell you those stories for me and for you. I'm here to tell you the story of how my name, Ahmed, but more importantly, my heritage and my Arab and Muslim identity is being reclaimed by a new generation, a generation that is connected through the democratization of media. Now, the Arab world is undergoing a social and political revolution, challenging the role of women, religion, and yes, even democracy in society. For example, in June in Saudi Arabia, a couple of brave women got in their cars with their father in the passenger seat, some of them, and videotaped themselves driving, which is banned in Saudi Arabia. And they uploaded it to YouTube. And in doing so, this act of bravery, let's fast forward to just the day before yesterday, the king of Saudi Arabia finally announced that women in 2011 have the right to vote in municipal elections, this was two days ago, and they can even run in municipal elections. Now in these countries, for decades, civic engagement was not only not tolerated, it was suppressed and oppressed at times brutally. But just as the Arab world is undergoing a revolution, so is the media. It's going through a revolution that in a large part is fueling the Arab revolution, or what we call here in the US the Arab Spring. Now, okay, back to this slide. 50% of the world is under 30. I'm included, if you haven't noticed. 70% of the Arab world is under 30. I mean, really think about that for a minute. And these young people have turned to the internet to engage with others, to share ideas and grievances, and eventually to mobilize. And as the internet penetration grew, and economic situation worsened, millions of young, educated, but unemployed and very frustrated youth, including one notable man in Tunisia in late December, have acted out. This is the man. His name is Mohamed Bouazizi. Now, he was a fruit and vegetable seller who set himself on fire after a police woman confiscated his food cart, and in doing so, perhaps took away his will to live as well. Now, I'd like to play you a video, but I'm just going to preface it by letting you know that just a week before Bouazizi set himself on fire, that's when I arrived, as he said, to uh, Washington, D.C., to launch this show that would tap into conversations that are already happening in social media and really leverage those voices that you don't hear from. Because Al Jazeera's mantra, or mission, if you will, is to give voice to the voiceless. Now, our show gives people that platform. We aggregate tweets, Facebook posts, conversations that are already happening on YouTube, and our guests all join us via Skype. No satellite feeds, it's all via Skype. So the news of what was happening in Tunisia was already being discussed and reported, I found, and shared and reposted and criticized online long before the mainstream media. So there I was, building this show, producing the show, and coming across all this information. Now, in the first week of January, uh, we've lost a slide, it's okay, came across a hashtag called Sidi Bouzid. Now, with images of student protests and injured demonstrators and police abuses, I was able on Twitter and through uh, Facebook as well 
to see you know, these images. And eventually, within a matter of, I think, 35 minutes, I was able to find this guy on Twitter and Skype with him. Um, and he was a Tunisian young student who was telling me about how school was canceled and explaining to me why. So we were Skyping you know, from our offices in Al Jazeera. And it's worth mentioning, his name, too, was Ahmed. And just like on a side note, you know, I grew up in Egypt. So you can imagine like, whether I was in math class or whether I was in a cafe, you know, someone would say, Ahmed, you'd see 12 people turn around and everyone's trying. Although in this crowd and in this country, it's not, not quite the same problem. But on a serious note, I learned that something very serious was happening. And I felt as though the mainstream media or the world needed to hear about it. So me and a colleague created a video, which I'm going to play you a very short clip of, in order to share with the world what we were witnessing at a time when the mainstream media was largely missing the story. So let's just play that video. A fruit and vegetable seller from Sidi Bouzid had set himself on fire on December 18th, and suddenly, reactions on the Twitterverse were exploding. Following the hashtag Sidi Bouzid, I called up hundreds of photos and videos showing students protesting, police abuses, and sporadic gunfire. As the messages went viral, protests broke out across the world showing solidarity with Tunisia. Tunisia unrest makes waves in Lausanne. Demo Hashtag tomorrow to the Tunisian embassy in London. A flash mob is planned in Berlin on Saturday. The beginning of a revolution was unfolding and the mainstream media was just beginning to catch up. There are no reporters in Tunisia to tell us what's really happening. About this sooner. Mass media has totally failed. Terrorism equals lots of media coverage. Democratic revolution equals little media coverage. Terrorism equals lots of media coverage. Democratic revolution equals little media coverage. It's true in the 10 years since 9-11, the media and media consumers, therefore, have become so used to associating <coughs> Arabs and Muslims with images of terrorism, destruction, and sectarian conflict. But what was emerging in Tunisia and Egypt was a popular uprising that was independent of religion, was independent of politics, and was even independ independent of class. They wanted the old leadership out. That was their simple goal, their uniform you know, goal. And they wanted the promise, at least, of a new future. And since then, we've seen that spirit of civic engagement spill from you know, uh, you know, nearly every aspect of society. We've seen it spill from the virtual realm into the streets, into the courtrooms. I mean, literally, in every spectrum of society. And in Egypt now, there are these events called Tweet Nedwas. This is just one example you can see right behind me. It's basically the word Nedwa in Arabic means a symposium or a gathering, much like the gathering we all are having right now. Uh, so it's hundreds of netizens or tweeters or tweeps or whatever you want to call them meeting in public life and answering questions that are sourced from online. Now, the first event happened just after the revolution and it addressed the role of the Muslim Brotherhood in politics and public life, or Islam in general. And it was based on the rules of Twitter. As you know, in Twitter, you have a 140 character limit. So you know, all the guests who were speaking, they would get a panel of guests. They would have to speak for 140 seconds. And uh, you know, those in the audience who agreed with them, you know, in the form of a retweet, as it would be online, would uh, shake their hands and go like this. Um, in order to indicate that they agreed. As you can see, they have the tweets up on the monitor right there. So today, a new generation, as I said, forgive me, I think this is the old slide, but we'll make two. Um, a connected generation, inspired in part by universal human values and universal human aspirations, are reclaiming both our reputation and our right to self-determination. Now, just so you know, this is a makeshift computer lab in Tahrir Square because people refused to leave in Egypt during the protests. So as you can see, they have their laptops and wires. I mean, the Egyptians uh, are, are kind of commonly known in the Arab world to be very resourceful. Um, and the New York Times called this Al Jazeera's moment. This isn't Al Jazeera's moment. This is the people's moment. As you can see, these people right here, Al Jazeera, like Twitter, like Facebook, was just a vehicle. It just accelerated and amplified their messages. And it connected them to more people in both English and Arabic. Their voices were the ones echoing from rooftops across the region. They were the ones confronting the governments in the street. As you can see, this is an iconic photo of protesters praying and enduring water cannons being sprayed upon them. Now, Google, to be fair, did not play a small part. They worked with uh, Twitter to launch Speak to Tweet, 
um, allowing voice messages from mobile phones to be translated into tweets in order to be, uh, in order to make sure that the voices in Egypt, their voices would get heard even in the advent that Mubarak would shut down the internet. And even our reporters on the ground used Twitter as a publishing platform. When our signal was scrambled by governments or when there was no internet, they would text message their friends abroad. They would find someone who was reliable in order to tweet on their behalf. But it really were, was, again, as I said, the people that were the reporters in Tunisia and Egypt. Sending Al Jazeera thousands of pictures and videos documenting uh, you know, the face-off with government troops. Now, even in Bahrain, trying to get, get this. There you go. We'll just go back. Even in Bahrain, we have hundreds and hundreds of videos, as you can see right here, that are sent to us every week. Just this morning, we had 33 videos from these Shia villages. These are stories that don't exist in the mainstream media. But thanks to social media, they send it to us on our show, and then we try to bring them to a wider audience on our TV show. There you go. There's 33 videos just this morning from Bahrain documenting pol police abuses, including the use of tear gas inside of homes. Now, there's been much speculation as to what role uh, you know, social media has played in all of this, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And while critics like Evgeny Morozov are right to point out that there certainly is a dark side to the internet, for example, governments using these very tools to target through targeted phishing operations activists, lure them into the streets, you know, publishing false reports of uh, protests on Twitter, and then arresting them, and in some cases, killing them. But still, overwhelmingly, these tools are being used to expose corrupt government officials and document police and military abuses. Now, this is one quick example. Right here, you see this is called Harass Map, and it's based on the Ushahidi platform. What it is, is it's a site that emerged out of the revolution that allows women or anybody in Egypt to document sexual harassment. In 2008, there's a statistic that 90% of women have reported uh, sexual harassment. So this tool allows you to not only say if it's a cat call or a comment or you know, if it's some sort of uh, sexual invitation, um, but these tools are so powerful because you can do it from your mobile phone. And in Egypt, even though the internet penetration is only 20%, everybody, nearly or practically, um, has a cell phone, at least in the major cities. Now, I grew up in Egypt for nearly a decade. I moved there with my family in the summer of 1992. The internet would arrive one year later in 1993, but it would be two decades later, 2011 in January, that the internet would virtually be shut down in Egypt. I mean, Mubarak really pulled four ISP providers and took the internet offline. Ironically, when he did that, you can imagine what happened. You have people who are so accustomed to using the internet to discuss things, to meet with people, to congregate, to share ideas, to criticize the government through anonymity, because you can't do it in the streets. So when the internet was shut down, what did they do? He just sent thousands and thousands and thousands of more people into the streets. Now, the internet launched in the early 80s with the idea of being a global village, a place for people to connect, share ideas, and discuss things. But never before has that global village been as ubiquitous and accessible as it is today. And on our show, The Stream, we not only source stories from social media communities, we nurture the growing reality that we are all media consumers. Everyone in this room, uh, everyone on television, everyone who writes an article or a blog post. And so, you know, the democratization of media is nothing more than the manifestation of technology and human curiosity. The media is changing. We all know this. I'm not telling you anything new. And hopefully, it's becoming more honest and more transparent in the process. The whole notion of objectivity. I went to Columbia Journalism School. They're going to hate me for saying this now. I also taught a couple classes there. And that's where I learned. It was ingrained into me. Objectivity, objectivity, objectivity. Well, you know what? Objectivity doesn't exist. It might sound blasphemous, but Fox News is not objective. CNN is not objective. MSNBC is not objective. Lean forward. NBC is not objective. Al Jazeera is certainly not objective. There are so many variables that influence what you're reporting, what language you speak, what you choose to include in a piece or an article, what you don't include, how many times you repeat it on the network. Transparency, not objectivity, in today's age in journalism, is replacing objectivity, or at least it should be. 
So if you're to remember anything from this presentation, for those of you who are still awake, which hopefully is a majority of you, um, I want you to remember this. The democratization of the Arab world, or any potential for the democratization of the Arab world, is directly related to the democratization of media. And our show cultivates that relationship. It's my job on the show as co-host to monitor what our communi community is saying in, in, you know, in real time and bring that to the conversation, to challenge our guests, to challenge the discussion. Ordinary people from all over the world challenging what we are discussing on our show. Now, while editorial oversight rests with us, we use aggregation tools like Storify, which allow you to use tweets, photos, videos, and bring them into a story using what we call editorial connectors right there, as you can see at the top, to curate a conversation that's being crowdsourced from the entire community, the online community. But we also invite our community to do the same. So they submit, you know, Storifies to us, and in a couple of instances, we then choose the best, and then they appear on our show for 25 minutes. It's a daily live talk show, and they talk to us about their Storify and about their stories. I can't tell you how many times I've been on this website. It's called Bamboozer. Now, Bamboozer is a live streaming uh, cell phone service from across the Arab world. As you can see, this was, I think, uh, you know, currently where people are live streaming from and broadcasting. Now, of course, the quality of these uh, videos are very low. But at the end of the day, let's be honest, because of the economy and because of so many things, reporters can't get to every corner of the world. So, you know, it might be 5 a.m. and I've been sitting there for three hours watching a bamboozer live feed from Morocco, but forgive me, that helps me feel more informed. And I think that goes to, to say, you know, with a lot of people who use these kinds of tools. Because for far too long, the dominating narrative around Arabs was one of oppression, terrorism, and lost opportunities. I'm 27. My formative years growing up in this country, that's what I witnessed. But now young Arabs and Muslims everywhere in this country and around the world are finding opportunities in technology. I was asked to come here and share something with you that inspires me in the hopes of inspiring you. Well, if anyone symbolizes that spirit of change, that right to self-determination, to choose your own destiny rather than let a dictator dictate, your future, it's Egypt's new revolutionary comic superhero named Flagman. Now there he is. He emerged in July on top of a lamppost in Tahrir waving the Egyptian flag as protesters continued their calls for reform. And you'll notice in one of those photos, the first time he climbed up there and he was documented and it was shared on Twitter, he was wearing a ratty old Nike t-shirt by coincidence that said, just do it. I mean, you can't script that, right? And he did just do it. And every time there was a protest, he would appear, he would emerge, and he would climb to the top of a lamppost, a building. I mean, this guy literally was um, at first being called Spider-Man, and eventually it evolved into, into Flagman. But it, it soon became clear that the Egyptian government, even after Mubarak fell, the military was not reflecting the people's interests. They wanted people to be charged, the criminals who had tortured people, and so on and so forth. And so whenever there would be a large protest, he became a symbol of the people. People would look to find him, to see him. And not only to the Egyptian people, but to the millions of people who were following this captivating story around the world using the hashtag, for example, Flagman. Now, he is also the symbol of why perhaps I'm standing here before you and why I'm all the more proud to be who I am, to be Arab, to be Muslim, and also to be named Ahmed. Because his name, like mine, is Ahmed. His name is Ahmed Shahata, just one of millions of young Arabs, and perhaps as many Ahmeds in the world, who are reclaiming what it means to be Arab. And I must say that I am looking forward to the day that this Ahmed and this video, which if we could just roll the video I want to share with you, it's a stop motion video that appeared on YouTube. There it is. This is just to give you a sense of how celebrated he was. There were countless videos like this um, that were uploaded to YouTube. And what I was saying was I really look forward to the day that either this video of this Ahmed or another Ahmed gets as many hits, if not many, many, many more than the Ahmed the terrorist video that I shared at the beginning of this presentation. Thank you very much.